would like to thank uh, Pietro Galizia. I think, um, uh, is, uh, like in a golf tournament, probably you might have uh, uh, the, the shortest, uh, <laughs> uh, because I think you have been the fastest of, of, of the speakers. So there is a, a, sp a special um, uh, prize for the briefest. Um, I think. Um, the majority of you know Clive Aston. He has been head of uh, the defense of um, the Steamship Mutual for many years, uh, then uh, has been a legal consultant and practitioner. Now he is, uh, full, has been arbitrator for many years. Now he's a full-time arbitrator. And uh, he, so he represents also the class of the arbitrators, who is, uh, you know, uh, probably more than the court, uh, at least in the matter of uh, charter parties and shipbuilding contact, uh, the, the decision maker subject in, in many disputes. He'll uh, give us 10 tips for bad market times. He's got 10 minutes, so each tip uh, will last uh, one minute. <laughs> it's a very easy calculation. Well, the idea of 10 tips in 10 minutes was always going to be ambitious, so I'll, I'll see how we get on. Um, I put five pound down that I would do it in 11 minutes, but we will see. Um, the title talks about bad market times. The truth of the matter is that what I'm going to say applies in good markets as well, but of course in a bad market it becomes even more important. Um, I'm going to make points that are probably familiar to most of you, but it's no, uh, it's no harm to remind yourself of these occasionally. Uh, the first five or six relate to the importance of getting the arbitration off to a good beginning, and then the, the second half relates to the conduct of the arbitration itself. So the first point I'd make is an obvious point. It's no good having a claim if it's time barred. Many contracts provide for the LMAA terms to apply, but the LMAA terms don't impose any time bar. Under English law, the contractual time limit for commencing proceedings in court or in arbitration is six years. But sometimes the contract will provide differently. In many tanker charter parties, the clauses will say that documents must be submitted within 60 days of final discharge or the claim is time barred. Maybe the arbitration clause will state expressly that the arbitrator is to be appointed within one year after discharge, so that's clear as well. Or it may be that there is a clause paramount in the charter party, in which case if it's a cargo-related claim, the charterer will have to commence proceedings within one year. However, the owner will not have the same time bar because, of course, under the clause paramount, the time limit only applies to claims against the carrier. Brokers always forget this, and many owners really overlook it as well, especially on the tanker side, the, the need to have a good arbitration clause. You can specify in your clause whether you have one, two, or three arbitrators. Uh, normally, it's three. There are different time limits that uh, apply for the appointment of an arbitrator. Now, if you have a claim against a charterer who is in financial difficulty, you want to get your arbitration tribunal in place as quickly as possible. You want to try and apply for an immediate award. Under the NYPE form, if uh, the Clause 17 arbitration clause, there is effectively 21 days for the opponent to appoint their arbitrator. In many clauses, that's changed to 30 days. Now, if you're in a hurry to get an award, 30 days is an age. The BIMCO arbitration clause says 14 days, and if they don't then appoint, you can appoint your arbitrator as the sole arbitrator. Uh, there's nothing, however, to stop you from changing that to read seven days so that if you really are in a hurry, then you've got a clause that helps you move matters along swiftly. I mentioned tanker charter parties, the ASBA tank voy. It's an out-of-date wording of the arbitration clause. It requires three arbitrators, 20 days between each appointment. So it can take two months to appoint the arbitration tribunal where there is a default uh, and where the other one party does not want to participate. 
Equally, it's very common in fixture recaps to say arbitration in London, English law to apply. But if that's all that you say, English law says that if you do not say how many arbitrators there will be, then there's only one arbitrator. If there's only one arbitrator and the parties can't agree who that will be, you have to apply to the court. I've certainly had cases where, for example, in Brazil, the respondent was in Brazil, it took many months to serve the application to the high court that had to be made for the court to appoint the arbitrator. So the claimant in that case took, I think it was six months to appoint their arbitrator, and it cost them about $20,000 just to start the arbitration. If you put a London arbitration clause in a charter party, it does not mean that English law applies. I think I'm right in saying that the NYPE form does not state the law that's going to apply. I had a case recently as arbitrator where there was a European owner and a Chinese charterer involving the carriage of cargo within the Far East. The way it works is that in that case, the proper law of the contract turned out to be Chinese law. There was London arbitration, that's what the parties agreed, but it was Chinese law. So if you want to make sure that you're going to have English law in your contracts, write it in or make sure that the pro forma clauses state English law shall apply to this contract. That's a very common tripwire, and indeed, luckily, many lawyers in London seem to overlook the point. Very often, if you start an arbitration, each party will appoint their own arbitrator, and then the lawyer will say to those arbitrators, please now appoint the third arbitrator so we can begin the case. We as arbitrators almost always come back and say, well, why don't we delay the appointment of the third arbitrator? We can vary the arbitration clause to agree that we will only appoint a third arbitrator if we find that we cannot agree. The reason for that is obvious. It saves the cost of a third arbitrator. But also, at the beginning of a case, we may not know who the appropriate person will be to appoint as third arbitrator. We don't know if it's a technical case that requires a technical arbitrator or a broking case that might require a broker um, as the third arbitrator. So if you're asked, do you agree to delay the appointment of a third arbitrator, as long as both parties agree, that's a contractual variation and is a very sensible way of moving matters forward. Many people are very uh, reluctant to agree to a sole arbitrator, especially where their opponent has suggested somebody. But I would say that you should very seriously consider a sole arbitrator because they will still, if they're from the LMAA or they have an established arbitration practice, be impartial. Uh, and also, it will save the time and the cost of the arbitration because obviously one person can work their way through a case more quickly than two or three having to consult with each other as the matter goes along. People are very lazy starting an arbitration. Even P&I clubs will often just send a, a message saying, we have appointed somebody as our arbitrator. And they say nothing else. But the Arbitration Act has very specific requirements. Um, for example, it will require that you specify very often the dispute for which you're making the appointment. It will require that you ask the other party to appoint their own arbitrator. You have to make it clear that you are asking them to do something. Many people also will just send a notice of arbitration to a P&I club, but the P&I clubs do not have an authority to accept arbitration notices on behalf of their members. And I would always say to people that if you've been conducting correspondence through brokers, you have to ask the brokers to provide you with the direct contact details of the other contractual party. Because it's only if you can serve the notice on that party that you can be confident that they will not later pretend that they know nothing about the appointment. Sometimes the clauses will state that the notice must be served on an officer of the company. 
Now, this, again, can be quite hard work because you have to look up and find who the officers are. And if the other party is from the Marshall Islands or Liberia, it becomes much more complicated. So in those cases, you may have to ask the other party if they agreed that you can serve notice of arbitration on the managers. Very often they will agree. If they don't agree, you may have to dig a little more deeply to make sure you send your arbitration in the right direction. The contract may specify the number of notices required. Under the NYPE, you send a 14-day notice, but then you have to send a second seven-day notice. So it's not good enough just to send one notice and think that you can then get on and appoint your own arbitrator as sole arbitrator. So you have to read the clause. They're not exciting clauses, arbitration clauses, but they're very important in order to start an arbitration on the right foot. We're always asked, can we order that a party puts up security for a claim? The answer is no, we can't. What we can do is we can order a claimant or a counterclaimant to put security up for the costs of the party against whom they're making their claim. This is a way of making sure that frivolous claims are not pursued and that if somebody pursues a claim, and it's being brought on, on very weak grounds, that they have to commit money that they may lose at the end of the arbitration before the arbitrators will proceed with the claim. Many people think that if they have an arbitration, it's going to go to an oral hearing at the end of the process. Probably about 85, 90% of cases are decided, however, on documents alone. So don't by any means feel that you're not getting your proper deal if the case goes on documents alone or if you're asked for it to go on documents alone. If you want an oral hearing, that will involve extra cost. It will also involve a delay before the hearing can be fixed because you have to coordinate everybody's diaries. And very rarely is an oral hearing necessary. It's only really when you've got personal evidence that's important or expert evidence that really can't be given in writing. Speed and consumption claims, no problem. They can be done on the basis of written documents only. Uh, very rare cases nowadays that one has an oral hearing. Usually, as you probably know, costs follow the event. However, Arbitrators can order that if a party has pursued 10 claims and only succeeded in two of them, that the costs are divided. And it may be that you could win a claim, but if you've lost on a number of the issues in the claim, that you will find in that situation that the cost order is actually made against you. Which really brings me on to my final point, some ideas for the conduct of arbitration. Every time you send a message to the arbitrators, you're increasing the cost of the arbitration. The arbitrator reads and has to charge for that reading and any work done. The day when you can put forward inflated claims and speculative arguments is really gone. It's a professional industry now, and if you make an inflated claim, it's very transparent, and you may end up having a costs liability as a result of doing so. Many people will not be, uh, are not prepared to admit the facts of a case, but where something is obvious, be brave enough to accept the facts because you know that at the end of the case, it's going to be shown to have been the case anyway. I'm a great believer in personal conduct, contact, and this, I think, is very important with the lawyers. Too many lawyers now get excited behind email uh, computers on their desktop, and they lose the personal element. The most successful claims in London are the admiralty claims where people know each other well and tend to pick up the phone and speak to each other and make progress far more easily because there is then a human element to the case. It's far harder to be rude to somebody on the phone or face to face and so you're more likely to make progress by personal contact. A case changes from the beginning to the end so consider settlement at every stage of a case and stop and think whether the case has changed from when you first saw it. If you're an owner or a charterer, don't let the case go to sleep in the lawyer's or the P&I club's hands. 
check and see if it's changed. I've had many cases where an owner has come to me at the end of an arbitration and said, if I'd have known that that was the case, I'd have settled it halfway through. So keep on top of your cases. Stay rational. It goes back to the personal contact point. Everybody gets excited about their disputes. The party, the lawyers, etc. And I've just got a few examples that I think by showing you will make you realize how important it is to step back and realize how stupid you're really being sometimes in a case. This, these are all messages that came from leading London law firms in arbitrations copied to the tribunal. So sometimes people try to be sarcastic in their messages. So this message said, if we knew what the owners meant by their facts, we would respond. But as we don't, we can't. But in any event, we deny it. <laughs> this party decided it was better just to be rude to their opponents. So they said, dealing with these charters is like playing chess with a gorilla. Well, you can imagine the legal costs that arise because this message led to a reply which led to another reply. And of course, the client gets billed for this. This one wanted to become violent. Please, with the charterer's solicitors, advise us of the identity of their case handler at their office so we can phone them to tell them what we really think of their message. And then this one, I think, is my favorite because they decided to be rude to the tribunal. We should be grateful if the tribunal could explain its thinking, if indeed it is thinking. So please, when you get into an arbitration, if you're really excited by a message, leave it until the next morning before you reply. Thank you very much. In, in, in Latin, uh, I think the scar would call this cogito ergo sum, so some tribunals perhaps don't exist. <laughs>